Thank you everyone for attending. I'm very grateful, very honored to be at the Supporter Summit. I just want to extend a thanks to my sponsors, uh, Brian and Shanna Tvenstrup. And uh, it means a lot to me that my talk is being sponsored, so I hope it will live up to expectations. And if if not, uh, John, you can close the doors, right? <laughs> yeah, no. Um, okay, so what am I talking about? I'm talking about Wall Street in the, the origins of Bretton Woods, right? We've heard a lot about the, the dollar. The theme of this conference is the, the end of the dollar era. What might that look like? And if we think about what the end of the dollar era means, it's, I think it's very helpful to understand how we actually got to this dollar era, how we actually got to the dollar as the world reserve currency. What was the process behind that? Was this just a public interest uh, motivated legislation or were there actually sort of some crony forces at work, et cetera? And I wanna, I wanna talk about this because we all know about the, the origins of the Federal Reserve. It's sort of the, the code you, you, in order to get into the Mises Institute. They say, all right, where was the Fed founded? You got Jekyll Island. You go like, okay, who was at Jekyll Island? And you have to name at least two or three people. At least that's what I had to do. So <laughs> I, I, I don't know if any of you had to go through the same test as me. Um, and, and you might remember that we've got Nelson Aldrich. He was a famous senator from Rhode Island, and he was the Aldrich plan. And what's very fascinating is like father like son, his, his, his son, Winthrop Aldrich, uh, was actually played a big role in uh, setting up Brenton Woods. So that's interesting. Uh, runs in the family. Uh, just so we know what Bretton Woods was, Bretton Woods was the system created after, really right around the end of World War II, and it lasted until the early 70s, and this helped establish the dollar as the world reserve currency. Uh, the dollar was redeemable internationally in gold by large banks, by governments. $35 would buy an ounce of gold. Uh, other currencies were redeemable in dollars. Okay, so the, the United States currency was, in a sense, the reserve for all of the other currencies, at least of the, the free capitalist world, so to speak, uh, countries in Europe, Japan, etc. And this created an enormous demand for the dollars. So the dollar was redeemable in gold, uh, at least for some people. Everywhere else, it was redeemable. Uh, other cur currencies were redeemable in dollars. You also, Bretton Woods created the, the IMF the International Monetary Fund. This is government funded, and it would loan uh, dollars to various countries for currency stabilization. If they were at risk of suffering a devaluation under this, uh, under this, this regime, they could get a, an infusion uh, from the IMF, right, which still exists to this day. And also the World Bank was created. Uh, this was government and privately, this is part funded by the government, part funded by uh, private funds, as we'll talk about, such as Wall Street. And this would loan dollars abroad for infrastructure development. Uh, a loan to Chile to build a road or a loan to Europe uh, to, to, build, to build some sort of infrastructure. So these two institutions helped spread dollars around the world. And this is often under the guise of foreign aid. Okay, so th these are heavily linked to the Bretton Woods system. All right. And so what I want to do in my talk is I want to show how Wall Street banks, uh, so particularly the Chase National Bank, which was led by Winthrop Aldrich, uh, Chase National Bank is now part of J.P. Morgan Chase, very famous institution, prominent. Some of you uh, hopefully are, 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 are um, know of. In uh, affiliated think tanks, uh, the Council on Foreign Relations, right? The, the council that we all know and love, um, and not quite, but uh, that that was play a big role in Bretton Woods, as we'll see. And, and they played a big role in devising and lobbying and also shaping Bretton Woods. So there's a lot of parts to this story. I'm going to go through, obviously, just a, a condensed version. I hope to elaborate this uh, on this in, in future books and in future papers, et cetera. And why did Wall Street want Bretton Woods? What, what were they going to get out of it, right? Was it for the good of the United States? No. Uh, they wanted other countries to hold the dollar as reserves, Right? They wanted the dollar to become the world reserve currency. This would increase the demand for dollars. Of course, all of their assets and uh, securities, et cetera, are denominated in dollars. Uh, this would increase the prestige of New York City as a worldwide financial center. They also wanted other countries to borrow more from Wall Street. 
Okay, Wall Street in the 1920s had grew tremendously loaning to Europe and to South America for a variety of reasons. And in the Great Depression, a lot of these countries defaulted on their loans, right, which Wall Street was not happy about. Okay, Wall Street, it, it was a risk. And that's, of course, it's a market risk. But if you can get the government to get rid of that risk, that's even better. And Wall Street wanted these countries to not default on their loans. Right, so they basically wanted the United States to lend them money conditional on them repaying Wall Street back. Right. So Wall Street stood to gain from this. And for that reason, Wall Street played a big role in shaping the Bretton Woods system and in, 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 in making the dollar a uh, world reserve currency. Because in the 1920s, uh, the dollar was actually technically a world reserve currency. Um, Post-World War I, Wall Street and the New York Fed uh, with Great Britain, they created a new international gold exchange standard. Now, Dr. Salerno has, has briefly spoken about this gold exchange standard. It's a, it's a phony gold standard. It's not, a, it's not the real gold standard. It's not the real thing we all, we all know and love. Uh, and why was it not the real thing? Well, it's because only dollars and pounds were redeemable in gold. The United States dollar, $20 could buy an ounce of gold. All right. Um, other currencies, they were not redeemable in gold or they were only redeemable in large amounts of gold bullion, which basically prevented your ordinary citizen from ever getting gold. Right. Other currencies in Europe and in South America were redeemable in dollars and pounds. So the idea was that the gold would tend to be concentrated in the United States and the United States could inflate, they could increase the money supply, and that would let other countries increase the money supply. And when people in those other countries wanted to redeem their, uh, their francs or their, or really you could say their mark, the German mark for, for gold, uh, they wouldn't be able to get that, they would get dollars, right? And especially in South America as well, uh, where there's a very famous, the so-called money doctor, Edwin Kemmerer, uh, made quite a lot of money going around South America in the 1920s, helping set up central banks. Right? Uh, now, what's very important about this system is that the Council on Foreign Relations, right, which was established basically 100 years ago, it was established in 1921. It, it heavily advocated this, and it supported the creation of a new worldwide uh, monetary system, and it praised the heads of the Federal Reserve and the Bank of England, Benjamin Strong and Montague Norman. They said they're doing great work, all of this stuff. Lots of Wall Street bankers had donated to the CFR. They served as prominent directors. These were some individuals associated with Kuhn Loeb and in, in company, uh, as prominent investment bank, J.P. Morgan in company. Company, another prominent investment bank, and so on. So this was a this was a big deal. This was not something that just came spontaneously, so to speak. This was devised and this is planned after World War One. And when you look at the holdings, this is some new research that's been done over the past uh, fifteen years or so. The you look at the holdings of central banks and governments, their foreign exchange reserves. By 1929, the United States dollar was actually composed 55 percent. Right, so it had already technically beaten out the pound, right? Technically, in a sense, the dollar had gotten that a little bit of that world reserve currency status by then, right? So it's it, we already had gotten there by the 1920s. Right? Okay, so what happened? Right. Well, the, the Great Depression destroyed the gold exchange standard. There were runs in Austria and Germany, and then that spread to Great Britain. Great Britain left the gold standard in September 1931. Then there was pressure on the United States, uh, pressure in South America. A lot of South American countries in particular defaulted on their loans to Wall Street, which really hurt Wall Street. The entire government engineered monetary system had imploded and that put a lot of pressure on these overexpanded fractional reserve banks and they started to implode and the entire system crumbled. Great Britain adopted a fiat pound. They put all of their countries on this new currency block, uh, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, there's satellite countries we could think of. And in early 1933, the United States left the, the domestic gold standard where internationally, this was settled after a, a little bit of experimentation by FDR, uh, internationally $35 would be redeemable for an ounce of gold. Right. So the United States was, was, was basically left the domestic gold standard. And 
this was an issue. Wall Street didn't like this. Uh, J.P. Morgan and company supported the United States leaving the gold standard in early 1933, but they everyone always wanted to go back. And by this time, Wall Street was, was led, really the major bank, for a variety of reasons I can't get into, was led by uh, Chase National Bank, a okay, very prominent bank. It had the most assets. It had like $3 billion in assets. So again, this is before some of the Fed's moderate inflation, but that was a lot back then. And uh, the, 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 the chairman of the board uh, was Winthrop Aldrich. Right? He was the son of Nelson Aldrich. Uh, he had married uh, John, um, uh, he was related to the, the Rockefeller family. I believe he had married, um, uh, he, he had married one of the, 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 the Rockefeller daughters. Uh, he, was, he was linked in. And uh, Aldrich and other Wall Street bankers, they wanted a new gold exchange standard. And Aldrich also around this time became a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. Okay. So it was about, okay, how can we get rid of all of these currency blocks? Germany's got its own unique system going on. Uh, Britain's got its own system. The United States is no longer a world reserve currency. How can we actually uh, create this, uh, a, a new system? Okay, how, how are we going to be able to do this? What is, what is the strategy, so to speak? Well, uh, Wall Street got a big boost during World War I and World War II, uh, would lead to a, uh, a similar uh, boost. So when World War II breaks out in September 1939, you've got Germany invading Poland, Soviet Union follows not too long after that. Um, the Council on Foreign Relations, their prestigious journal, which is, which is still around uh, today, Foreign Affairs, uh, the editor of that journal, talks to the State Department uh, having some secret communications about devising a new post-war order. So this has been this has been established. This is in the archives. This is in the history books, et cetera. Uh, the State Department didn't always give the Council on Foreign Relations a whole lot of credit for this. But again, that's that's part of a sort of a, a secret arrangement, and uh, it, it, it's very clear that the CFR uh, influenced the the United States uh, uh, system. You could say leadership after the war. And in, in terms of the foreign affairs editor, in his words, he said, World War II provides the United States with, quote, a grand opportunity, end quote, to become, quote, the premier power in the world. Right. Economics, military, uh, politically, et cetera, this is our opportunity. The, the British Empire was no more, and now we can become, uh, you know, the, the, the Duke of New York, a number one, so to speak. And so the State Department agreed, and there was various study groups, uh, they were called study groups, that were devised between CFR officials, other prominent intellectuals, State Department officials during the war to think about the post-war. So you had one on armaments, uh, armor, you know, weapons, you had one on diplomacy, and it was all about how, again, the United States is going to be uh, a new leader, the new leader. And from our perspective, there's the economic and financial group. Uh, which was going to devise the new economic order, particularly regarding uh, topics such as tariffs and also regarding currencies. Right? How are we going to rearrange the world currency systems? Right? We don't want to go back to the 1930s where you have all of these currency blocks in these constant uh, trade wars in um, uh, competitive devaluations, beggar thy neighbor policies, as they are often known, so on and so forth. <clears throat> so what did Wall Street want? Well, Wall Street and Aldrich, they were very concerned about this new Bretton Woods system that the economic and financial group was devising. If you remember the Bretton Woods system, the, the main points was that the dollar would be a world reserve currency, you'd have the creation of the IMF, and you have the creation of the World Bank. Uh, and as this proposal was being was, was gone out into the public, the CFR was getting ready to uh, push for this proposal. It was going through Congress, et cetera. Aldrich and Wall Street, they did not want the IMF making long term loans uh, because they would compete with their loans. They wanted to be very clear that uh, it would be a complement and not a substitute to what they were trying to do. So they didn't want. Uh, they didn't want countries going to the government agency instead of going to their own private institutions, right? So that was one thing they wanted. Uh, the other thing they wanted is they also wanted the World Bank and the IMF loans given only to countries that repaid back their earlier loans from Wall Street. 
Okay, this is a very big concern. They did not just want countries that were not paying their previous loans to then get more loans, and then they would forget about uh, the previous loans they had taken out from Wall Street. And this was a serious concern. In 1945, 87% of European bonds and 60% of South American bonds uh, were in default. Okay, the Euro European bonds, we can make, that makes sense. Okay, there was World War II. There's basically Europe was completely decimated. Uh, South America, South America was, uh, had borrowed a lot in the 1920s and you still had some bonds that were in default, a great deal of them. And this was an issue because a lot of them were, were given out by Wall Street and they uh, still, still had them. So what this really means is that Wall Street wanted these countries to raise taxes to pay off these loans. That's more or less what it came down to. They said, look, you got to have the money. You got to pay off your loans before you can borrow from these new uh, government agencies that we're helping to create. And Aldrich testifies in front of, uh, testifies in front of Congress. It's, a, it's a partially a lobbying campaign also with the American Bankers Association. A lot of stuff going on. And Congress does revise Bretton Woods. This, this was enough pressure. And the agreement was that the IMF loans would only be for short-term currency stabilization. Right, which is more or less what Wall Street wanted there. So they were able to get the system where it would really act as a complement and not as a substitute to the Wall Street loans. Okay, so where does that leave us? All right. um, <laughs> Wall Street get, gets what it wants. And um, one, of my, uh, one, one of my favorite pictures, I guess I could say, um, uh, of Winthrop Aldrich, because there's actually not that many pictures of him, you can find this on Wikipedia, et cetera, is this is Winthrop Aldrich with Marilyn Monroe. In the 1950s, uh, in his later life, Aldrich was ambassador to Great Britain, and here he is at a nice dinner with Marilyn Monroe. I have no idea what they're talking about. I have no idea what Aldrich is thinking. However, I'm going to assume that it was about Bretton Woods, <laughs> right? What else would you talk about? And notice the surprise Aldridge is telling uh, Marilyn Monroe how the system works, and you can clearly just see she's completely mesmerized um, and, 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 and just totally shocked at this. So uh, this is at least... <laughs> Uh, you can find these online. They're very freely available. I just find this is really funny. This is Winthrop Aldrich's Wikipedia page. He's got a picture of him in his nice military outfit when he was a young, a young strapping lad. And then he's got some pictures of Marilyn Monroe. So I, again, I'm going to assume they were talking about Bretton Woods uh, during all of this. So Bretton Woods gets passed. Bretton Woods gets created. Uh, who runs Bretton Woods? How is the system actually getting off the ground? Now, something Murray Rothbard was always very big on was the, looking at the actual personnel who run the situation. Very often, the government passes a law, and everyone applauds. We get a couple news articles about it, and then it just sort of you know, disappears from the, 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 public, the public mind. So the real attention early on in the post-World War II era was not the IMF so much, because that was kind of relegated to a short-term currency stabilization status. The real center of attention was on the World Bank, because there were a lot of juicy reconstruction loans, so to speak, right? A lot of loans to Europe, European countries decimated by World War II, a lot of loans to South America. Europe was previously a major investor in South America, and now the United States would supplant that role. So it was all about the World Bank. And one other thing about a lot of these loans is that you loan dollars to countries, and then if they want to rebuild themselves, they need to buy cement, they need to buy equipment, whatever. Where are they going to get that from? They're going to get that from large American corporations. And this is a whole other sort of set of cronyism going on, the Marshall Plan. Unfortunately, I don't have time to talk about that, but it's a fascinating story in itself. So here's how the process worked. Wall Street lends money to the World Bank, right? They buy, they buy World Bank bonds and other securities. Then the World Bank lends money, part Wall Street, part government, uh, to countries that repay their earlier loans from Wall Street, right? They raise taxes, right? Th th those are the terms. You want more money, you got to pay back your earlier loans. So Wall Street basically collects two checks. They get the money they, 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 they lent before, and they also get uh, money from, um, uh, from people paying off their World Bank loans. So this is really the, the, the World Bank was kind of like a Wall Street operation, so to speak. And what's fascinating is Aldrich uh, gets Truman, right, president of the United States, Harry Truman, uh, to appoint John J. McCloy as president of the World Bank. I don't know how many of you have heard of John J. McCloy. He was a, he was a big, uh, big figure back in the day. He was a prominent lawyer for Chase National Bank. 
after his time at the World Bank. What does he do with his life? Does he retire? No. He becomes chairman of the board of Chase National Bank. And he also becomes head of the CFR. So it's, it's one giant family, right? It's one giant happy, ha happy family of all the, of all the cronies uh, working together. And so McCloy and then his successor, Eugene Black, who is also a former vice president of Chase, they really n does, does steer the World Bank into Wall Street's uh, uh, vision, right? And this is, this, this is a very important point that a lot of times it's not necessarily what's in the legislation per se, but it's more about what's in the actual actions of the people appointed to run said agency. This is why when investigating a government agency, you have to keep investigating it even after it drops out from the public, uh, the news cycle, so to speak. And that's exactly uh, what people didn't do, or not, not that many people did. You think of this World Bank as this big public, uh, public-minded institution, and instead it's kind of run by it's run by a bunch of Wall Street uh, bankers. Okay. So in the late 1940s and the early 1950s, the World Bank makes loans in Asia, I think of in Japan, uh, in Latin America, uh, Chile, um, other countries is very noticeable. Apparently, uh, the, the, the Chile loan, there was a, you can find this evidence that they demanded, they got a, the World Bank got a call from several prominent Wall Street bankers saying, you have to make sure Chile pays off its earlier loans. And like a day after that got the call, <laughs> World Bank said, look, you got to pay off your earlier loans before we give you this loan. There's got to be some sort of package deal. So it's very much you can see Wall Street's influence. Uh, so you've got countries in Latin America. You've also got countries in Africa. And then, especially in the 1950s, you have countries in the Middle East. Uh, in the 1950s, that's when oil politics starts to become a very big thing. And so, again, it's all part about making sure that these countries are linked to the United States and to the dollar. You're granting... Uh, loans to these countries in dollars. They're going to use those dollars to buy things, to back their currencies, et cetera. Right. Ch uh, Chase National Bank, uh, its post-war foreign loans increased by 85%. That's a huge amount. Uh, the Chase uh, was, was granting lots of loans in, in, in terms of dollars. It was becoming a, a, a worldwide bank. Uh, Chase and, and other banks, uh, such as National City Bank, which we now know of as City, uh, they established branches around the world, right? So you have these, these 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 global banking enterprises, and they have their they have their banks in a lot of countries that the United States has now now has troops in, right? And that was a part of a condition. They say, well, if we're going to establish a bank in Japan or a bank in countries in Europe, we want to make sure there's also United States protection and so on. And that was that was heavily linked. There was a lot of stuff going on with the Marshall Plan. These banks were handling. Um, economic Cooperation Administration Funds, which is the agency designed to administer the Marshall Plan. Uh, they were heavily involved in that. And the dollar becomes the world reserve currency. Other currencies are now redeemable in dollars. And there's foreign aid basically pushes all of these dollars out from the United States across the world. Right, so you have this huge supply of dollars. There are now dollars in Europe. There are now dollars in Asia. There are dollars in South America. There are dollars in Africa. There's dollars everywhere, right? Dollars for you, dollars for me, dollars for outside, right? Dollars for everybody, okay? And this was the beginning of the, of the establishment, or not really, you could say the, the yeah, the beginning of the, of the establishment of the United States is having that world reserve currency status, which has continued after Bretton Woods. Right? There were some issues in the 1970s, but that, that, super, you know, that, that superpower status has continued. And a big reason for that was Wall Street. Right? Wall Street, that was one of their motivations, and they were able to accomplish that. So uh, to conclude, right, Wall Street lobbied for a new international monetary system, uh, and they got key personnel appointed. Right? That's the first important thing you need to remember from this talk. Uh, the second important thing you need to remember from this talk is that Bretton Woods led to dollar dominance and benefited leading uh, United States banks. Okay, that's the second important thing you need to know from this talk. And the third important thing is you should buy cronyism, rise of the corporate estate when it comes out, right? That's the third and the most important thing you should know from this talk. So thank you very much.